the session is going to go. We'll chat um, a little bit. If you have questions, make a note of them, and then we'll open up for questions and answers towards the end. Um, with the permission of Nobuyu and Anne, I would like to bring some voices into the room of other African women and women of color, because this feels like um, a moment that is not always the case where we have three African women in one room. Do I have your permission? Do I have your permission? Great. So the first voice I'd like to bring in is Panaji Chigumadzi. Did I pronounce that correctly? Where do we go in search of our mother's stories? How will we get to know we weren't the first to be here? Who will tell us of their troublesome and transgressive lives? None other than themselves. Listen. And now, Maya Angelou. You have been paid for, each of you. Black, white, brown, yellow, red. Whatever pigment you use to describe yourselves has been paid for. But for the sacrifices made by some of your ancestors, you would not be here. They have paid for you. So it is your job to pay for those who are yet to come. Hi, Angela. To understand ourselves, I think, it is important to understand our history. Nobuyo Rosa Shuma. The truth of a story is always determined by the teller. Remembering women is in many ways remembering yourself. Anne Mora. I'd like to begin, ladies, by asking you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine some sort of a meal. Um, it could be a dinner, lunch, whatever it is. Imagine that meal and imagine who you are sitting at that meal with. I want to know who the other women are around you. I want to know what you're eating. I want to know what you're listening to and I want to know what the conversations are. And each of you in the audience can also do the same. Take 30 seconds, just close your eyes. Imagine for a moment. <laughs> conversations there are about contemporary marriage, being a contemporary woman, and what marriage is like now, um, outside of the official channels that people believe that marriage is. Yeah. yeah. Delicious. Yeah, very delicious. Are there any women from the past that are coming into that conversation? My name was spoke about sex with my mother. She was a very, um, she's a very um, traditional woman. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing an aunt of mine. <laughs> I, will not, I will not say what we're talking about. And my grandmother on my mother's side, who was a very um, brisk woman, very blunt, would, uh, you know, when you're a teenager and they just come and they poke you, like they squeeze your breast, like they're growing. You know, this is something about boys, you know, and then you get the look from your mother. Like, mm. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. What about you, Maura? Um, also wine, definitely wine. Um, matoke, because that's only the thing I want to eat. Um, I, I think, yeah, I kind of went in a similar vein in terms of I wanted, I, I immediately thought of kind of the people I'd love to have answers to myself from. I mean, it's because of the quotes you're reading, so some of whom may or may not be fictional, so I was thinking of like Mumbi from the school tradition and 
Mora, who I'm not named after, but who's a famed um, medicine woman, let me say, from the DC community, and um, even like fictional question mark characters like Lilith or Eve. I'm kind of curious about all these women, fictional or not, that just be like, so what, what was that like? Was it always that bad? Was it always, was it better? Was it worse? Like how, what is it that is the same? There's something a friend pointed out to me um, ages ago, like I was having a conversation, my mother was there, and she was saying how we have the same squint when we're kind of spotting nonsense. Like we just did the same. <laughs> and I remember, when she described it, I remember my, I remembered my grandmother had the same exact face. Like if I was doing something silly and like dumb, <laughs> and like something she did not approve of, I'd get that same squint. So now I'm like, I wonder how far back that squint goes, mm -hmm. and how much, and I kind of, you see it even, I see it, I've seen it with you, no way I've seen it with you, I see it most of the people here, that little squint of like, hmm, something isn't right, and I really wonder how far back that squint goes in like our history. Um, yeah, and of course, I kind of want to go to your dinner party more, don't you? it sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the ladies do all the time. Yeah, <laughs> so true. So that impulse of something isn't right, um, I'm going to take that thread from you and kind of follow it through a little bit further. Um, both of your work, um, some, some of your work, in some of your work, you're really interested in kind of excavating um, the past and looking at the ways in which we've been that perhaps um, aren't instantly visible. Um, and this idea of mm, something isn't right. Um, is there a moment or like that you that 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 impulse became clear to you? Mm. And this is for both. You know, I think it's always been elusive for me, and that's been part of the joy of excitement. Um, so in terms of chasing that impulse, I think this refers more to House of Stone, like, which is a novel about history, much more novel about history than a historical novel, and so it's a marvelous history. Um, and it's sort of inserting itself. Um, so I think one of the key things that this book does, which Zimbabwe will notice implicitly, but outsiders may not, is that it, it takes what, what is known in Zimbabwe as Ndebele history and claims that, centers that as Zimbabwean history, which becomes important because what, especially what even you as an audience have heard a lot as Zimbabwe's history is actually Shona history, the specific ethnic, ethnicity's history. Um, and I think that something's not right is something I grew up with, just sitting on scans in Zimbabwe, um, but became more heightened in South Africa during a lot of the xenophobic attacks. Um, but, but I think for me the, the illusion is that the more you excavate, the more you find. You can actually keep going way back in history. Um, and that is, I think, the delight. Um, which is also to say I couldn't put everything I wanted into the novel. <laughs> there was just too much. Um, but in terms of characters that sort of scans, for instance, there's this lovely character called Tandi. So the novel is told by a male called Zamani. I always hear, happy to hear, like, um, a, review, a male reviewer said there was a feministic intervention because of Tandi. Um, though he said something controversial about, about, about that piece. Um, you know, that fe feminism is, is questioned here because when Tandi gets pregnant, she blames um, the man that she's um, sleeping with. Um, but Tandi for me became that sort of interesting, not quite seen, not maybe quite interested figure in Zimbabwe's liberation war history. She's a young, feisty female. She's very passionate, and she joins this Heinstein movement. And it's, it's she's actually the center of that movement more than the males around her. Um, and some of them are drawn to her for the, if not cliche things, oh, she's beautiful, she's gorgeous, but she's also very smart, very commanding. Um, so much so that in her relationship with the Nico, um, which is something which was fun, she 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 runs the relationship in a way. Um, he's a rural boy, so she you know she decides when they meet, when they have sex, when not to. Um, so it was also sort of an interesting sort of way of <sighs> trying to, to center a female figure who sits who sits a scant in history, um, but also to sort of make the things that are important to her important. The story they put put into history. Yeah, absolutely. Um, House of, so to, to, to talk a little bit more about House of Stone, um, there's a really beautiful uh, review in The Guardian um, that, that sums up the House of Stone in this way. 
by the end, Nobuyo has managed to not only sum up Zimbabwean history, but also all of African colonial history, from devastating colonialism to the bitter wars of independence, to the euphoria of self-rule and the disillusionment of the present. It is an extraordinary achievement for a first novel. And more delightfully, um, this is from Helen Habila, he says, Shuma is incapable of writing a boring sentence. She inhabits her narration so totally that even the most absurd and silly actions become believable. The wordplay and absurdist plot lines act as comic relief, but the author never lets us forget the serious stuff even for a moment. And it is this balance that makes the book work. You know, when I heard Helen was reading the book, I got scared. I was like, oh, <laughs> like it's over. Because he's known for being, um, I don't know, harsh or honest. Yeah, so I was like, oh, my goodness. So that was, that was a great review to read. Could you read us something? Oh, from how so? Yeah, last three years. Let me read something from Tandy, since I've been talking about her. She has a chapter named after her. So what happens is Abednego, this is 1974, this is, um, so Zimbabwe is still Rhodesia, Abednego is a rural boy, he's just arrived in the city of Bulawayo. And you know how it is, uh, courting uh, rituals in, in the rural areas are very different. So he's walking and then he sees this girl, this beautiful girl, so he follows her um, to a, sh a shop. And when he gets there, he introduces himself to her and he tells her he loves her, which I, I, I'm sure the, I think this is a universal African thing. This is how oh, God, boys yes. profess interest, <laughs> not love. They don't really love you. But I'll say many, many foreign women who visit fall for that lie, don't they? <laughs> they take it seriously. He loves me. Ah, he doesn't know you, my sister. This is the professing initial interest. It's a ritual. And then the woman's supposed to say no, even if you like him. You keep saying no. <laughs> so, um, so he's met this woman. He's followed her. But Tandy sees him carrying a newspaper about communist Rhodesia, so he thinks she's she thinks he's a spy. So she's very hostile towards him. Like, what do you want? But he keeps coming back. Okay, so let me start here. So now he finally Tandy, because Abednego's been pestering, uh, agrees to go out with him. Yes said finally to sing, pretend I have a deep voice. This is a, this is a money the narrator narrating as a young man. Yes, she said finally to sing him outside of the stifling confines of Tiki Tai, where they were chaperoned by the glares of the Indian woman, though I imagine her eyes must have fluttered from weariness rather than delight. How to explain to her that he too was fatigued, tired of obsession, drained by mania, enamored of revolt, never mind that her surrender was without Enthusiasm. A victory still demanded a victory dance, so that later, alone in the communal bathroom of the hostel, he would bend his bony legs, click his fingers, and bop, bop, bop to the floor. Uh, there is a soccer field down the road, just around the corner from here, on 2nd Avenue. Meet me there tomorrow during your lunch break. She checked that there weren't any customers lurking in the house before she replied. Listen, listen. I'm not one of your rural girls, okay? Your rural girls, you just see and profess love to, and then take to the bush to fuck, okay? She said, fuck in English. He gave to her. Such a vulgar woman. Were hers really the rangers he wanted to colonize? You rural boys need to learn some manners, she continued. I'm not some piece of meat you just happen upon and just prod, prod to your liking. I'm an Angela Davis, and you respect my feminality, okay? He wanted to ask, who is Angela Davis? Is she your mother? Is your mother Angela Davis? <laughs> what does she have a white person's name? But she looked really pissed off, so he just nodded. She regarded him out of the corners of her eyes. You ask a cultured girl out for lunch and afterwards a play. Mm. He pretended to be considering this, though his heart was in his throat. He had no idea where to take her. What she expected out of lunch and a play. What sort of play was this? Did she mean playing under the covers? <laughs> was she a proposition? <laughs> Uh, I can get us some nice food from the Sun Hotel, he said finally, and afterwards we can play. <laughs> eyes lit up. The Sun Hotel, yes, that's actually a brilliant idea. No, 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 I didn't mean take you there. I mean, you know, no muntus are allowed there, okay? What I meant was my uncle, you know, he works there, I could get us food from the kitchens, then we could go somewhere nice, like maybe the Centenary Park, and sit under the trees with that blanket. Don't be ridiculous, she said. 
That sort of thing is for people who have nowhere to go, and then they end up trying to grope one another behind the bushes. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you, Nagoya. Mora, to throw the question at you, is there an impulse? Was there a moment in which you had that impulse that something isn't right? Um, so I'll, I'll do the thing of digressing, but it's a point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently when I was two or three, I was like diagnosed with stress. Like I was oh. taken to the hospital and the doctor was like, she's stressed. And they were like, she is three. What is there to be stressed about? So I suspect I came out of the womb feeling that things don't make sense. <laughs> And it's kind of fundamental in, in the world. I'm constantly like, but why? But why is this happening? But this doesn't make sense to me. Um, and I, I don't think it's just, I think it's something that um, a fair amount of people do have. I think a lot of children, especially, like when you talk to really young kids, they're always like, but why? But why can't I go outside? Mm -hmm. But why can't I do this? Like there's, there's, a, there's a very deep inherent way that when you come out, you, you don't have things set on you yet, so you're always wondering, but why this and by why that? So I don't, I don't have a particular moment that I can say, this is a moment that I was like, oh, I need to realize this. I think it's something that I've always kind of grappled with. I think my challenge has been learning to accept that that's a question I still have. I think I thought at some point an answer. This is a problem of like, Type A, slightly, you know, the kids who get good grades are not really that hard, I was that girl. And so I assumed that, like, figure it out just because, and that was a lie. So now that I'm, as I'm getting older and I'm working on myself and on, on reading and trying to understand the world in a bigger way, that fundamental thing of understanding that there's really no full answer, there's no full-fledged answer to but why. Like, <laughs> when your parents say, it's like, because I said so, a lot of the time, that's actually the answer. It's because somebody said so. Yeah. And it's, I, I still haven't figured out how to, re, to answer that question for myself. And I think that's what I keep trying to answer. And I'll keep trying to answer in everything that I'm trying to do. Mm. Um, mm. I, keep, I think I've told you this before, and I, like one of my, my one like, kind of light bulb moment this year was when I realized the reason I tend to do so many different types of things is because I just want to answer the same question all the time and I get bored of it myself, so I'm like, maybe I'll figure it out if I write a play. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, maybe if I like edit something, oh, that didn't fix it. Okay, maybe if I perform a poem, oh, that's not it. Maybe if I go back to the play. Like it's constantly trying to play with different mediums and forms to still answer that same question that I think every child has of, but why? Um, yeah. Um, you said something else that really made me think. Um, because I said so, that things are the way they are because I said so. Yeah. And it really makes me think about the way that our history is taught to us. Mm -hmm. Is as arbitrary, or maybe arbitrary is the wrong word, but you know, is as specific as because a certain type of person said so. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, more I know that I'm privileged to be privy to many, of, many conversations with you. Yeah. You're particularly interested in looking at history and unraveling it from a different point of view, particularly a feminist lens. Mm -hmm. Um, what has that experience been like for you, and what do you discover that perhaps was veiled before? Um, so, I think what's been, uh, what's been really interesting has been, I think learning, something I should have learned, I think the biggest lesson I've been learning is how much this, I am not the first person to be doing this, to ask this question. Mm -hmm. How many women, how many people, have been asking these questions for hundreds of years, not even like in the last 10, like for, if you can go back and go back and excavate and you find, oh, the first um, university was started by a woman because she wanted to like question the status quo. Like you can keep going back and back and back in time and learning that I'm not the first. And I think the, the greatest gift that, that kind of feminist understanding or feminist approach to history and the greatest loss that the way history is taught now with this very specific, um, and specific across like each country has its own particular, particular hegemony. Each, um, the patriarchy of course is everywhere. There's like heteronormativity. There's all these different structures in place that want a certain type of history. The greatest loss of that is that you just, 
you, you can't fully see yourself. You can you can you just can't fully see yourself. You just don't understand how much of yourself disappears. I went through um, the group of schools education, and that was from in a bit for my parents at the time to really try and like, let me get them the best education. And in that education, you're being taught that your blackness was mediocre, and that we came to save you. And it took years for me to unlearn that. And I think this point when I'm still unlearning that. So the, the deep loss of not seeing yourself in your entirety because you're not allowed to, because it is important and it is imperative for you to know the history of yourself, the history of your own bones through one lens, through that lens, through the lens that maintains that particular power structure. And that's what that's what maintains that because I said the because I said so, because the moment you push further than that, like that's not good enough. There's so many other people who've said it wasn't good enough. In fact, here's a list of books. In fact, here's a giant set of histories that told you. My own, that, you know, your own grandparents were probably having the same question and fighting the same fight. So it, it's such a tragic loss not to be able to see yourself fully because it's been specifically taught out of you. Um, yeah. I kind of went wrong. I don't know if I answered no, your question. No, I mean, it's, 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 but why? Yeah. Um, it's so brilliant because it, it reminded me that's actually how I tried to write the work, with the childlike wonder. So that link of children yeah. and asking questions, which seems simple, but um, and not simplistic, very different. Yes. Um, um, and, and this idea of one lens to tell our history, you know, um, it's interesting when I was reading up on Zimbabwean history, the idea of the one lens and repatriating history. Um, so this is a patriarchal history, a phallocentric history. Mm -hmm. So that the word feminist is a swear word. Um, it's interesting, we have this prominent Debele historian, and he was he was trying to repatriate Debele history, like pre-colonial history. And he was talking about the history then, how it was very really male, you know, phallocentric, you know, worship the penis. God of all society. Um, and then he mentioned that women were considered minors. And it's an interesting history because, um, so then I was reading up about Queen Elizabeth, and I couldn't find, for some reason, there's not enough um, scholarly work on her. So I was now reading Zulu history because the Nivellis and Zulu, Zulu royal women. And then it's interesting that um, this idea of the word women as minors came with the British. Mm -hmm. So they came to the region and they, because in their culture, they didn't recognize women in the same way that those societies had a space for yeah. women. Um, they did not want to talk to the women, they wanted to talk to the men. And so that changed social structures. So the men no, now no longer needed to talk with the women to order for society to move forward. But they called the women minors. So it's interesting to see that language taken forward. So you have this phallocentric, also pseudo-Christian history mm. being mixed in 2019 by males who are trying to repatriate history. And it's also a problem in Zimbabwe now. Yeah. And it becomes so male-centered that it Cuts, cuts out the women and the contribution, and then women only come in as figures to be revered. Yes. Never, and, and to revere um, a woman, a male, a female figure is actually in this day and age not a sign of, it's not a positive thing. No. It's infantilizing, right? Um, yeah. To engage critically, right? To take that woman seriously and her role in history mm. is more threatening. Um, yes. So it's, it's amazing. So I think that, that important work, and also what you've just been saying about realizing that you're not the first. It's also very difficult in Western spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Because they always want first. Everyone's right. the first, and so you, you find these impossible. Um, it's like I know even House of Stone, like the first. To, like no, there was Yvonne Vera. Yvonne Vera wrote about Kutura right. Kutura, right. the Stone Virgins, right? Um, and before that, she was talking to her people. Um, and you'll find um, in scholarly work, um, scholars who talk to communities, right? Oral history. Right. But there's this fetishization of being the first, the only, to mm -hmm. do something. Um, and it erases knowledge. It's very dangerous because yes. it erases knowledge. And then it also can posit the wrong history as knowledge. Yeah. And then it has this impossible bearing up of one person, one black person, as being the person. Yeah. And you've seen that problem with Chimamanda. <coughs> well, I love it greatly. I, I, I admire her. But you've yeah. seen that problem when you take yeah. one, one figure and they become the know it all about everything. It yeah. is problematic. Um, and it is part of a structure that's never been set up anyway to take our history, so take ourselves yeah. seriously. Yeah. And, and just to add on to that, like, I think one of the things that really, the, the kind of very obvious 
read quite startling revelation to myself of like, oh, you're not the first person. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite good you're not the first person. Imagine how much easier life is for you because you're not the first. Mm -hmm. That moment, I think this deep desire to be the first, I always had that. I had my grandfather on my father's side who always asked me, and Kenyan education, I know you all know. No one cares about what grade you got. Are you number one? <laughs> that was the question. He spoke three English sentences. Hello, how are you? Are you number one? That was it. And so it was so ingrained and I'm learning that. It's still something I struggled with. I could really have a complex about like, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't the best. I didn't get the this. Instead of I did the thing and that's amazing. But more than that, it also does this. And it's something I've been noticing a lot more in the last couple of years. It's a very deliberate structure, a way of moving in the world that erases labor, mm. and erases the amount of work people do, mm. and the labor that's erased is always going to be the people who are more powerless in that structure, always. The amount of women who have worked, worked in spaces, in, in literary spaces even here, in art, cultural spaces, in historical spaces, who have built things, who have created things, and suddenly, because there is a hunt for the first, somebody must be the one who did it. Who was the person who did it? It must be that person, and that person will often be the powered person, the cis man, the cis person, the male person, the heterosexual person, the white person. It will always go to that person, and suddenly the work and works that people have done is completely obliterated. And I, I've really been struggling with the fact that I, and it's something I'm trying to be a little, significantly more conscious of, that by naming all the people who you have worked with mm -hmm. and for mm -hmm. does not diminish the work you have done. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make your work any less. By naming all the people who inspired you, it doesn't make the work that you've done any less. Yeah. And that's, I mean, even culturally, traditionally, black traditions, I remember ages ago hearing about um, the way music moves, like in the Caribbean, and like the rhythms, and it's like this, the rhythm is public. Like you can do what you want with it. Like the concept of storytelling in African traditions a story didn't belong to you. Mm. Like it was everyone's. And there's something powerful in that because it's a recognition of the fact that yes, you have a specific power, but you're not the power. Mm. The idea of a single person holding the weight and being the first. Mm -hmm. Not to celebrate someone, not to say you shouldn't be celebrated if you're the first if you are the first. Of course you should be celebrated, but <laughs> the hunt for that really is so it's so damaging and dangerous mm. in a way that I think people overlook. <laughs> what you said just reminded me, um, I'm in academia in the USA, I'm a PhD candidate, um, and this idea of, so I feel like the cis white man has now been, slowly been displaced, mm. and it's, it's a good thing, but it's also dangerous by the, you know, the black token figure, mm -hmm. and institutions, right now diversity is like the craze, it is not a bad thing, it is important to get more people, but it's open to exploitation. So mm -hmm. you'll find classrooms where the knowledge that's being taught is white, yeah. Western, mostly male. Yeah. Then you will find um, but these spaces valorizing. We have three or four yes. black students. You're on the um, cover of every brochure. Yeah, I mean, I, I was at a, I will not mention at a certain prize that I'd been invited to. I was shocked. Every second sentence, we are diverse this year. We have the <laughs> most diverse You know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, am I a token? You know, you, you start wondering, am I a token here? Is it the work? You know? Yeah. And maybe it can be both, but it really it's a, it hurts. That it's also a moment of humiliation. Um, and it's it's so interesting to see it at play because it's also about stakes. Um, do you smile or do you be the person who doesn't smile? Mm -hmm. And what are the costs of that? I really feel that. I mean, I think that I, I, my first experience with a festival out of the continent really opened my eyes to the costs that um, African writers pay um, to be on the world stage and, and the way that you are expected to perform Africanness mm -hmm. um, and the way in which your work is tugged into conversations that perhaps it, you don't want it to be in conversation with. Um, in, with this idea of performing Africanness, I think it's a really lovely time to ask you, Maura, to read from um, that gorgeous catapult piece. Um, okay. Let yeah. me... Just to ambush you. Sure. <laughs> um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the idea of performing. Yeah. I was shocked. Yeah. Let's just say that. Um, Nobody and I were the bad Africans. 
So I was in Slovenia and it's a very, the place I went is like just shots, like Ndani, like it has like 600 people who live there, like it's a very small village. Um, and yeah, so I, I just kind of, it's a paragraph speaking about my particular experience in that space. Um, uh, the village is called Loche. Is it a village? <laughs> they always misremember things in Finland. It's fine, I can be sleep well, they sleep with us. Okay. In Loche, there weren't many people like me around. I heard that there were some black people in Slovenia, closer to the big cities, but in Loche, I was at best a rarity, which in turn made me a novelty. It was exhausting. Dealing with the excitement of everyone meeting their first black woman, keeping the smile up and brushing off the moments of discomfort because, hey, they didn't know better. The hairdresser aunt who, well-meaning and entirely unaware of the context and implications, dug her hun hands into my hair and said, ooh, black, beautiful, in broken English. The friends with the, I too have been to Africa, conversations. The stares. In the supermarket, the woman who stared at me as she pretended to pick groceries and rushed away when I stared back. In the parking lot, the man driving extra slow past us as we walked on the road in the bar. I joked, I can't get lost here. Everyone knows exactly who I am and who I am with. What else can you do but joke? I was taken to a kindergarten that some friends ran. They knew I enjoyed teaching and they wanted their students to meet someone from Africa. One child, upon seeing me, backed away slowly in abject terror. Literally took slow steps backwards, hits behind the desk, open mouth and a silent scream. I made a joke. I laughed to hide embarrassment. They laughed too to hide theirs. They whisked me away apologizing, unsure of what to say. It turned out that there was a black doll in the kindergarten. I saw it a few days later and I understood. It looked like a cross between Chucky and Red as played by Lupita Nyong'o and us, stitched by a particularly incompetent seamstress. I was terrified of it, so of course the child was terrified of me. Here I was, the evil black doll alive, and I was the only black doll they had. 